Hi Year 12 and um, welcome to this second video in which we're going to be exploring how Hardy presents the growing romance between Tess and Angel. Now this is from chapter 19, right at the beginning of chapter 19. So if you'd like to find it, the first paragraph we'll be looking at is, well it makes no difference, said he, you will always be here to milk them. So find yourself that spot. On my book, it's page 122, um, but it may not be the same for you. You might have an e-copy of the book. Have a look now, see if you can find it. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is the fact that it's midsummer. It's interesting that Harley is choosing this as a sort of peak of romance, because it's also the peak of um, the seasons in terms of fertility and growth in plants. And interestingly, um uh this begins on a summer evening and but hardy often pictures tesk at dusk or dawn so that's the last thing of the last part of the day or the very first part of the day and in between he makes use of the strange light this creates but he also suggests that these are liminal spaces a space for transgression that's crossing the line for outcasts possibly for romance, or maybe even for magic. Something quite magical about the descriptions of her. We have noted before how Harley uses sensory description, particularly sound, to evoke place, and more importantly, feeling. And he does so again here. If I move this up, you can look. So it's a typical summer evening. Um, it's a the atmosphere is in such a delicate equilibrium, it's a balance, and so transmissive that inanimate objects seem endowed with two or three senses, if not five. So he's drawing attention to the fact that he's talking about the senses. Now he talks about sound. He says, the, an auditor felt close to everything within the horizon. The soundlessness impressed her as a positive entity rather than as a negation of noise. It was broken by the notes of a harp. So you've got Angel up at his window playing the harp, Tess is in the garden, she's loving the sound blending that's happening around her. You'll note how this idea of sound comes back uh, in, in the next paragraphs. So um, there are some quite erotic undertones in this moment. In all other respects, Tess and Angel's sexuality is highly repressed in their clothing, their manners, their behaviour very limited physical touch, but here it is expressed by proxy through their garden setting. So look out for that throughout the book, you'll find lots of instances of repressed sexuality expressed through setting. So we've got um, the notes wandered in the still air with a stark quality, like that of nudity. Uh, so there's something sort of intimate and exposed and vulnerable in the music being played, but it, perhaps particularly because of the time of day as well. Uh, interestingly, Tess is like a fascinated bird and could not leave the spot to keep him behind the hedge. Now, you may remember that Tess was um, like a bird, uh, or like one of Mrs. D'Urberville's caged birds, uh, when she was with Alec, and he would teach her to sing through the through the fencing in the same way that she would teach songs to the birds. So you can ask the question, is Tess being ensnared by love, like one of Mrs. Durville's birds, or is she free and part of nature, like any songbird in the hedgerow? Uh, I'll leave that for you to ponder. We've got lots of interesting fertility references through this passage to growth, bloom, seed and pollen. Look, there's mists of pollen at a touch, juicy grass, blooming weeds, dazzling, uh, staining her hands, naked arms, uh, sticky blights. So she's got basically covered in everything that's oozing out of the garden. Um, an image of her perhaps oneness with nature. And interestingly here, definitely an example of, of a proxy emotion. We see that the floating pollen seem to leave his notes more visible and the dampness of the garden, the weeping of the garden sensibility. So the garden is literally weeping a proxy for the emotions Angel is arousing in Tess with his music. She is the one who wants to weep and yet it's the garden that seems to be weeping with that sort of lovely nighttime dew that settles as the air temperature changes and it creates dewdrops on the grass. 
I notice here Tess is having another out of body experience as well. The exaltation which she had described as being producible at will by gazing at a star came now without determination of hers. So the music in the dusk has created an out of body experience. Hardy draws attention again to her spirituality, her greatness of being, perhaps enough to make Tess. Um, is it Megalus Psychia, the greatness of soul which a tragic hero re requires? And finally, I want you to just ponder for a moment this amazing blending of the senses here. Sound, touch, sight, smell and emotion. And the intermingling adds to the emotionally charged nature of the moment. So, for example, the smell um, of, and the rank smelling of the weed flowers would not close for intentness and the waves of colour mixed with the waves of sound. So you've got smell, sound and, and, and uh, colour all blending together in this really intense moment. And of course, at this point, she's unseen, she's sneaking around and uh, that's adding to the tension between the two. Okay, stay tuned in the next video. I'll be having a look at the next page.